Christ is risen. And go Chiefs. Yes. Good. Thank you. Well, don't get mad with me, but uh, I love the Chiefs. I've been a supporter since I came here 10 years ago. I've been born and raised in Shawano, Wisconsin. I've always been a Packer fan. However, it's a good thing the Chiefs don't have to play the Packers today. Now they have a chance to win, right? No horn honking, I understand. Well, our prayers are with all of you that have a good week, enjoy the game, and as all in good fun and fellowship. We begin our worship with our opening hymn. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us confess our sins to God, our Heavenly Father, most merciful God. We confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given a Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord, 
Teach me your statutes. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart, I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes. With lips I declare all the just decrees of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Glory be, glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. No. with you. We pray, O Lord, keep your family, the church, continually in the true faith that, relying on the hope of your heavenly grace, we may ever be defended by your mighty power through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. From Isaiah chapter 40, beginning at the 21st verse, we read from this Old Testament lesson how much God loves us. He calls us each by name as the stars in the heavens. Have you not known, therefore? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the very beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretch out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to live in, who brings princes to naught and makes the rulers of the earth as nothing. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown. Scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows upon them and they wither, and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see, who created these? Who created these and who, he who brings out their hosts, the stars, and numbers them, calling them each by name? Because he is great in strength, mighty in power, not one is missing. 
So why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He doesn't faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. A second reading taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning with the 16th verse, tells us that we can empathize with people of all kinds, even sometimes with all kinds of faith, but do so without compromising your own. That's why Paul says, I do it all for the sake of the gospel so that I may share in its blessings I have become all things to all people, that I might by all means save some. So if I proclaim the gospel, this gives me no ground for boasting, for an obligation is laid upon me, and woe to me if I do not proclaim the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am entrusted with a commission. What then is my reward? Just this that in my proclamation I may make the gospel free of charge so as not to make full use of my rights in the gospel. For though I am free with respect to all, 
I have made myself a slave to all, so that I might win more of them. To the Jew, I became a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, so that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that I might by all means save some. I do this all for the sake of the gospel, so that I may share in its blessings. This is the word of the Lord. Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 1, beginning with the 29th verse. As soon as Jesus and the disciples left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak, because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still dark, very dark, he got up and went out into the desert, deserted place. And there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. And he answered, let us go on to the neighboring town so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came to do. So he went out throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. This is the gospel of the Lord. The most important thing in our life is not that God heals us, but that we hear the good news of the gospel. And that's what this message to you, the children's message, is about today. For the children. I have a stocking hat up here. You can't see it very well, but on it, there is an eagle. We know what eagles can do, don't we? They can soar high above the sky. In fact, it's the only bird that I know of, that the naturalists tell me about, that can soar way above the storms in life. Because the wind they use gives them lift. The Greek word for wind is ponoima. It means spirit. As the wind gives lift to the eagle, so God's spirit gives us lift to fly and soar way above the circumstances in life, even if when we head straight into the storms of life. Such could be our comfort and our joy. I believe we have some children out right there. Art there, is that right? Some? Uh, yeah, okay. Well, you know, I'd like to talk to you about the eagle. But I'm going to tell you a little story about a prairie chicken. That one afternoon, he found an egg. He sat on it until it hatched. He didn't know, this prairie chicken didn't know that this egg belonged to an eagle that was somehow abandoned for some reason we don't know. But anyway, he sat on the egg. And that's how an eagle came to be born into a family of prairie chickens. Now, while the eagle is the greatest of all birds, soaring above the heights with grace and ease, this prairie chicken doesn't even know how to fly. You know, like chickens we raise on the farm, they got wings, but they only flutter a short ways above the ground and land again. Such is the fate of a prairie chicken. In fact, they're so lowly, they, they eat garbage. Some of the stuff we need to throw out to the pigs. Predictably, 
the little eagle, being raised in a family of prairie chickens, thought that he was, therefore, what? A prairie chicken. So he walked around, ate garbage like the rest of the prairie chickens, and he clucked around like they did too. Scratched around in the garbage, finding some substance to eat. But then one day he looked up to see a majestic bald eagle soar through the air, diving, dipping, turning every which way, using the wind for lift. And when he asked his family what it was, they said, why, it's an eagle. But you could never be like that because you're just a prairie chicken. So they returned to pecking the garbage along with him. Now, you see, there's the moral of the story. The eagle spent his whole life looking up at eagles, longing to join them among the clouds. But it never once occurred to him to lift his wings and just try flying. Unfortunately, this story has a bad ending. The eagle died, thinking he was just a prairie chicken. Children, don't let people tell you that you can't improve yourself or be any better than what you are at something because it's not true. And first thing you want to do is prove it. Not to them. You don't owe them that. You have to prove it to yourself that you can. Because God knows you can. God gave you children many more talents than you ever could hope or realize. You just have to employ them. You have to use them. Whether it's in sports or music or some other form of entertainment. Don't say, I can't do this anymore. I'm not good at it. It takes practice to be good at something. It's not easy to be a disciple of Jesus either, is it? Many times we stumble and fall, and Satan will tell us even that, well, you're no, you're no better than the rest of you. But you are, because God says you are. We know Thomas Edison, the inventor of a light bulb, right? Well, he tried over hundreds of times to make a light bulb, but he failed every time. People started laughing at him, took him for a joke. Until one day, he made a light bulb that actually worked. And so people then admired him. I think he even got a Nobel Prize. But they asked him, what was that brought you to become a success? How did you become so successful? You know what he said? I learned how not to make a light bulb. So when you learn from your mistakes, you learn how not to do these things again and again. God makes room for improvement. He makes that room for you. You were born to fly. But some of you might think and act like prairie chickens because the world keeps telling you that that's what you are. You're better than that. God created you. In fact, he made you a little lower than the angels, according to Psalm 8. Do you ever feel like there's something more to life than what you're experiencing? Well, there is. Look up. Lift your wings and fly. God wants you to be all that you were created to be. The Apostle Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 14, As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. Don't let other people tell you what to do, what not to do, what you can or can't do. You know you can. God wills it. You are no longer ignorant. You know who and what you are. You are children of God, baptized in his name, called by name, like the stars in the heavens. You are born again through the living and enduring word of God. Now, I say live that way and spread your wings and fly like eagles. We continue with the next hymn.
Grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied within you from God, our Heavenly Father, through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, with the blessings of His Spirit that gives you lift, that you may soar above every circumstance in your life. Our text is taken from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. As a child, you were probably asked what you wanted to be when you grow up. Such a question could start our imaginations running wild. Maybe a policeman, a doctor, a fireman, a nurse, a pastor, teacher, and all these other professions and stations of life that God has made available to you to exercise the talents he's given you. Well, here's the question. Did you become what you said you wanted to be? And when you were asked these questions, did you ever ask yourself, well, what does God want me to be? You see, that question is not self-serving. That's a question that serves God and his intentions, beautiful intentions he has for you. Things will not always work out according to your plans. But God always has a better one. And I, I know a lot of you have had those experiences where you thought you had the right choice, the right road, and then God steered you in another way that may have brought a lot of hardship and sorrow, but in the end, you thank God for what he did for you. Let me tell you the parable about the three little trees. Their creator asked... What do you want to be when you grow up? Well, the first little tree said, When I grow up, I want the lumberjack to use my wood to make a beautiful bed for the king's chamber there in the palace. Then visitors will point to me and say, Hey, the king slept there. The king the second little tree said, when I grow up, I want the lumberjack to use my wood to build a swift sleek sail ship to carry men of royalty with their gold, silver, precious gems and spices across the seven seas. The third little tree thought for a while, though, and, and then finally said, well, when I grow up, I hope the lumberjack never comes. I want to grow tall, stately, and straight upon this mountain where I sit. For when people then pass by, they will look up into the heavens and remember the God who made us and still loves us. Well, many years later, a lumberjack came into the woods and cut the first little tree down. He sawed up its wood and used it, but not for a beautiful bed for the king's palace, but for a dingy little old shelter for his sheep and oxen with a trough from which they could eat. As he filled this trough with grain and straw, the little tree began to cry, for now it would not get its wish to be a bed fit for a king to sleep in. But not long afterwards, a man with an expected mother came into the shed because there is no room for them at the hotel. During the night, she delivered her baby and laid him in the trough. Today, people all over the world point at that trough and they say, the king slept there. You see, that little tree didn't cry anymore. Then a few years later, another lumberjack came along and cut down the second little tree, not to build a sleek, swift sailing ship, but a little dumpy fisherman's boat 
That tree cried and cried too, as it would never get its wish to sail the seven seas with its precious cargo and men of royalty. Then one day, while the little tree was crying, a young man suddenly pushed the little boat from the shoreline into the lake. He jumped in and began speaking to the crowd that followed him. He said how much his father loved them. No ship or boat nor Queen Mary ever carried such precious cargo than that little boat. Now that little tree doesn't cry anymore. For this itinerant preacher was God's crown jewel of priceless worth, Jesus, the pearl of great price. Several years passed. And finally, the third little tree, now grown up, very tall and stately, was also cut down by another lumberjack. That little tree also cried and cried because it would never get its wish to stand tall on a mountain and direct the eyes of all who passed by to look up and show them their creator, the God of love, full of grace and truth. Making matters worse, by the way, this lumberjack didn't even use the wood, but threw it on a wood pile so soldiers can use it once in a while for heat, for burning at night when the weather got cold. But then one day, soldiers took some of that wood and constructed a cross for a young man who would be nailed to it upon another hill called Calvary. Today, all over the world, the eyes of men fall upon that cross that points to the young man of divine, unconditional, unlimited, forgiving love, the Son of God. Now this little tree cries no more. It's the only life-giving tree in the world. You see, that first little tree sought fame, like a lot of us do, by wanting to be a beautiful bed in the king's palace so that people would point to it and say, the king slept there. Many people sick, seek recognition. They want to be popular by rubbing shoulders with the rich and the powerful. And yet, making a name for oneself is not the way to true happiness or success. It was only when the little tree learned a lesson on humility by becoming a dingy manger for God to use for his purpose. Thus, in service to God, that little tree found true joy and everlasting fame. Oh yeah, how about that second little tree? That tree wanted to become a great ship, carrying precious cargo and men of royalty. Yet it was only when it learned that the true abundant life can only come from above, that enables us to fulfill our calling that our Savior Jesus Christ has given to us through baptism. A calling that no longer serves mammon and the things of this world, but God and our fellow man. You see, mammon refers to property, wealth, all kinds of prosperity and success, and whatever serves our needs, because this is what we want it to be, this is what we want to become. Therefore, it becomes sin only when we begin to serve its needs and let it become our master that dominates our life. Don't let this world take control of yours. You take control of it. And by the way, that third little tree, that tree had perhaps the noblest cause of all. It simply wanted to point people to the sky where the Heavenly Father dwells. Yet it could never accomplish this until it was remade and shaped into an instrument that would forever keep man's eyes fixed on Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, the scorned its shame, that we might have life everlasting. That was the very expression of God's love for us sinners. A love unconditional. You see, here's the thing. All three trees finally got their wish. 
but not in the way they had expected. God had to remake, shape them in ways that would serve his purpose and provide a fuller, meaningful life for them. Isaiah 64, verse 8 says, and this is one of my favorite passages in the Bible, especially in times when things just go amok. The Lord says, O Lord, Isaiah says, we are the clay and you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. You see, God wants to shape and mold us into something far better than we could have ever imagined for ourselves. And that's why in Jeremiah 29, verse 11, Jesus says, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, but plans that give you hope and a future. And 1 John 3 says, How great, therefore, is the love our Father lavished upon us, that we should be called children of God, for that is what we are. Now, what we will be has not yet been known, but we do know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Like Job says, my eyes shall behold in none other as I stand upon the latter day upon the earth. I pray that we put the kingdom of God before our own. I pray that we will ask him how he might want to use us to his glory and in service to our fellow men. That our joy may be full with a life more abundant than we could have ever achieved on our own without him. With God, all things are possible. With God, nothing is impossible. That, I say, is what you want to be. That's what you want to do. So that the peace of God that passes all human understanding will keep and sustain your hearts and your minds on Christ Jesus, who is the resurrection and the life of the world to come. Amen. We confess our faith to one another and to our Lord in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, Pontius <coughs> Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. He descended into hell. The third he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we exchange the peace of the Lord to be with us all, let us honk our horns to one another as I extend God's hand of blessing and peace to you. God's peace to all of you. Thank you. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we pray that your blessings fall upon all those who are suffering ailments of all kinds. We pray for our first responders. We pray for all those who are in some affliction of kind. We pray for those who are unemployed and, and those who are not very well employed. This nation has suffered a great deal. Yet we know that you are there to pardon, give us peace, to forgive our sins, to give us that hope in the future that Jeremiah, your prophet, had foretold of us. In Jesus' name we pray, and as he has taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace from this day forth and forevermore. Amen.